good, very good. All right, you may be seated. The youngins can be dismissed, and uh, we'll go with Amy. And Brother Greg, if you come and minister the word to us. Well, good afternoon. Well, that's just because you, you helped me out. And I was going to make sure that I wasn't going to uh, to fix that for you. So I <clears throat> figured I'd leave that alone. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to come come down here um, to, to give first, I guess I should say, secondly, uh, just a greeting from the folks back in Frankfort, Kentucky, the group that we have. We're kind of small. Um, you all think you're small here tonight or, yeah, this afternoon. Uh, we're smaller than this, so just to kind of give you an idea. So if you're ever in Frankfort, Kentucky, the capital, of the state of Kentucky, come on and join us. There's a there's a joke down there that says how do you how do you pronounce the capital of Kentucky? Is it Louisville or Louisville? Well, the answer is neither because it is Frankfurt. But a lot of people are like, that's oh, our the, the one in Kentucky is pronounced Louisville, and it's because it's named after King Louis. Now, for what that's worth, that's free to you. You can do with what you please with that. Um, but but I do thank you all for the opportunity to come down, or come up, I should say, uh, to Louisville, uh, Ohio. And uh, Brother Ted and Sue, they've been tremendous so far. The the fact that they've opened up their their house to us and, and allowed us to to stay with them and uh, took us to a couple landmarks around town yesterday. And it was, I know I enjoyed it, and I think Delilah did too to be able to go down to Amish country and things like that. So. Uh, Go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 14, just to just to kind of give you an idea of where we're going. As Brother Ted said, it's 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 dealing with others over self, and specifically in the local assembly. One of the things that that we've come across over the past few years is we've kind of we've kind of grown into an internet church, which I'm not a big fan of, um, but that's the way it, that's the way it works. Um, it's hard to do those things that we're going to talk about t this weekend over 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 internet lines. And one of the things that we were talking about this this past past weekend is our my my hope and prayer is that the church wouldn't wouldn't go away from the building and just sit at home and, and do things all online. And I and I tell the folks even that, that watch us online just to remind them. The, the local assembly is the issue, and you've got to be in a local assembly. And so that's that's the basis of this. We were going through the book of Romans for, for a few years back home, and when we got to Romans chapter 14, we, we started taking a look at some of these things in a, in a different light, especially because of the, the connection that we have with folks outside of our four walls. And that really kind of brought it to our heart that the local assembly is the issue. And, and we need to keep that in mind. So that's one of those things that, that sometimes it's, it is what it is, but the local assembly is the, the, the thing. So, you know, you're talking about Charlotte and the passed away. When I think of, when I think of her and just the short period of time that we've known her, she kind of embodied this. Others over self. I mean, you can look at the testimony that she had in the church, in the church and not just the church, but the hospital. And she's looking at other people trying to give them the gospel. And uh, to bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and, and it's it's an amazing thing because you, you get to see what what you do in the local assembly does go out with you, and it should. Um, and so that's 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 where we find ourselves. So we're going to start off in Romans chapter 14, and we're gonna we're gonna start off in verse start off in verse 10. We'll read down through verse 19, and then then we'll get going. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account, shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus 
that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word, the fact that you've, pres you've preserved it throughout the ages, that we can have it before us, that, that we have a final authority that we can come to. And our prayer is that, that this is the final authority that we come to and allow that to be the thing that changes our thoughts, our precepts, and then we, we, we just allow your word to work in and through us to, to magnify your Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so as we take a look at this, I want to go ahead and get my stopwatch going on here because I'm... I'm kind of known as a little long-winded back home, and so I'm going to spare you all, um, spare you all that. So as we take a look at this, one of the things that we notice here in Romans chapter 14, when he starts off in Romans chapter 14, verse 1, what he's talking about there, he says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. So when we start off in Romans chapter 14, the first thing we need to know is there's a whole bunch of stuff that came before Romans chapter 14. Right? And so when we get to Romans chapter 14, Paul and God, by the way, is under the, under, under, under the impression that you already know the first 13 chapters. Right? And that's why he starts off and says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. And that, that phrase always kind of threw me off a little bit. What's the, what's the opposite of faith? Hmm? Unbelief? Where does that come from? And really, you think about what, what we have here is, and you go on down and, and through Romans 14, he's dealing with this. Doubt is one of those things that I kind of think of. That's where that comes from. And if you're doubting things, and that's, that's what I see here in Romans chapter 14, verse 1, he says, receive him, but not to doubtful disputations. Don't fuss with him to make him doubt what, whether he's lost or saved. And a lot of times what I've noticed throughout the years that we've been in grace and my wife and I we got married in 1999 she got me into our grace church back home in 1998 and uh, as a southern baptist boy when I walk in and I hear these people talk about the so-called great commission and that kind of throws me off for a second and thinking what do you think so-called that's that was the grace that was the great commission and so there was a lot of things that I had to, to overcome if somebody would have come up to me and said, why don't you get this? And just beat me over the head with it. That's what I think about when we're looking at this, is you, you come and beat somebody over the head with it, and then you get them to doubting. And that's the opposite of what grace does. And so the idea, when we think about others over self, really dealing with your personal edification, the first thing that we do need to know is we need to have edification on our, of ourselves before we can go and help somebody else. And it's not that, well, I know this, why don't you know this? This is simple. It's clear as day. Why can't you read? It's black and white. There's a guy back home. He, that's one of the things he first started talking to us about is that was the struggle that he had was he would get upset because people just would not read the verse and believe it. And so he would physically get upset with them. And so he's actually calmed down throughout the years because what grace does is it produces a life in you that's different than who you were. And that's the basis of really what we're going to be looking at this weekend. The first thing we're going to talk about tonight is going to be your personal edification, that process that we have. And then second, we're going to take a look. What, is that, what does that edification do? It or how is that how is it that that comes about is because the word of God is effectually working in us. Well, what does the word of God effectually working in us produce? It produces the fruit of the spirit in our life. And what the fruit of the spirit does is allows us to restore other people who have fallen away from whatever issue that they may have fallen away from or 
if they've not even gotten there yet. One of the things that we've looked at as we were going through Romans is, you know, somebody may not understand Romans chapter 3 that they've been completely and totally justified, that they have the righteousness of God imputed to them. They may not understand Romans chapter 3 and 4. The way that we need to find that out is we just have a conversation with them. You know, somebody may have that, but they don't understand that they have peace with God. Well, what do we need to do? We need to take them back to Romans chapter 5 and show them you have peace with God. Therefore, being justified, you've already got the fact that you're justified. What do we need to do with that is we now need to say because we're justified, we have peace with God. That's a byproduct of who we are in Christ. The identity that we have in Christ, that is a byproduct that we have peace with God. The one with whom we were against in time past. He has come along and said, I'm going to give my son so that I might be able to give his life to you. And I'm going to reconcile you, bring you back into, into, into union, living union with me. And I'm going to do something in and through you that could have only been accomplished by what my son did. And so what he does is you go through Romans chapter 5 and you find out we have peace with God. We were once again enemies with him. If you go back to Psalm 110, you read, what is he going to do with his enemies one day? It's not good. <laughs> but what God chose to do is to lay that aside through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son and say, I'm going to take my enemies and I'm going to do the one thing that you couldn't do to reconcile us. And I've made it possible for you to become part of what I'm doing today. Well, maybe somebody does get that they have peace with God. Maybe they're dealing with sin in their life and they try to figure out, well, what, am I ne what do I need to do? Well, then you get them to take them, you take them over to Romans chapter 6 and you find out something about the fact that we have victory over that sin because of who we are in Christ. And they may, be, they may still be dealing with that. They may have chapter 3, 4, and 5. They might have that locked down and understand, I'm justified, I have peace with God. But, and you know what? When you, when, you get to that, when you get to that chapter 6 and you don't really understand that you have complete and total forgiveness because of who you are in Christ, the identity that we have in Romans chapter 6, then do you really have that peace? Are you really living based upon the peace that you already have? And it's one of those things when we, when we think about this stuff, and we've talked about this back, back home, People who are in churches today, if they're saved, they are completely and totally righteous and justified, and they don't know it. That's the sad part about it, is they could be living a life that would be glorified, more glorifying to God because it's what Christ did through him, or what God did through Christ, and what he's doing through us. They're, they're missing that. They're missing the life that God has given us. And so those are some of the issues that, that we want to take a look at as we go through this. So when we, when we see some of this stuff, grab, a, grab Romans chapter 1. Because our purpose is that we want to edify one another. Well, the first thing is we need to know and understand how that edification process works. Right? So then we go over to Romans chapter 1. We're going to start here. Let's start in verse, start in verse 9. Romans chapter 1, verse 9 says, For God is my witness, whom I serve, with my spirit and the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I, might, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. So when we see what's going on here, what Paul wants to do is he wants to come to Rome to give unto them, to, to impart unto them a spiritual gift. The purpose of it, the end of it, the goal of that spiritual gift is so that they would be established. Right? And as you see, that's what he's doing with that. 
to the end that ye may be to the end ye may be established that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me now when we think about that what Paul's dealing with that that faith is that body of doctrine that he's delivered to Paul that he's written down in the books of Romans through Philemon and if we actually take that information and store it up in our soul because that's the whole issue of with the edification it's the building process growing up from about the age of 10 to about 8 18 my I helped my dad build houses the oddly enough the house that mom lives in now we built um, moved in 32 years ago I'm shocked that it's still standing in, in all honesty because most of the houses that we built strong great foundation the one that we built that we were going to live in the kitchen set in on a rock a big huge rock because some parts of Kentucky you just can't get rid of rock and no matter how hard you try that or clay that'll destroy that'll destroy trying to do something so so the the back part of the house that kitchen it's just basically sitting on a rock. Well, the back part, the back pan, it used to be, a, well, used to be nothing. Dad built on a little pantry, then he decided, well, let's build an extra room on, on the back of that. That thing's sinking in the ground, it's falling off, and it's, it's a mess. And, you know, those, those afterthoughts, let's do this. That's a bad idea. But when, when you build houses, the foundation is the most important part. And so when we take a look at where, where we are here in Romans chapter 1 specifically, this foundation that we're laying here in the book of Romans is the most important part. If we don't understand what's going on here in Romans, then we miss a whole lot of other things. And I just want to, this is something that's just jumped out at me the past few years. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> you know how you write notes? And uh, they're pretty much already <laughs> eleven minutes in. They're already I'm already off script. That's okay. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter three, verse ten. This is this is a verse that just jumped out at me one day as I was going through reading Second Timothy chapter three. Notice in verse ten, Paul of course is talking to Timothy, and of course we know what's what's going on with Timothy. Timothy's not not really. Not really wanting to to say, yeah, I'm I'm working with Paul or or anything like that. And he he Paul's come along saying, Don't don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of what Christ went through. Don't be ashamed of that. Stick with the doctrine. Stick to it. All right? And he just got through telling him in chapter two, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. He's saying, Stick with it. I tell my kids at school, I, I teach high school. Um, a lot of times when I say that, people are like, oh, bless your heart. And then I say, I teach math, and they say, get away from me. <laughs> then it's always, oh, that was the worst subject that I ever had. And so as with my students, a lot of times what I tell them, stick to itiveness is a thing that most kids today do not have. If it's not, if, it, if something lasts more than six seconds, they're done. What do you mean I've got to do two steps? Two? Why can't I just put this in the calculator? Well, drive down the road, get a flat tire, and see if you can put that in the calculator and get that fixed. It doesn't work. Not that I've tried, but because it's not possible. But stick to itiveness, and that's that's one of the things that I see that Paul is trying to get Timothy to stick to the doctrine. Don't worry about all the other things out there, all the ancillary things. And Here's one of the things that I find very comforting. In 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3, verse 10, Paul tells Timothy, he says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The thing that I find comfort there is he's saying, Timothy, the reason you're able to stick to it is because you have fully known my doctrine. You notice he starts off with that. That's, that's amazing to me because what he's doing is he's taking Timothy back to the doctrine and say, this is the main issue. You know the doctrine. And he's saying, you know my manner of life, the purpose, faith, long-suffering, and all that stuff. And he says, you understand the, the afflictions, the persecutions that I've gone through. We're all going to go through it. So don't be ashamed of it because that's part of the life that we have now. But he takes him back to the doctrine. So what we're going to find out this weekend is that's how we come across with other people and restore them. Take them back to the doctrines. Set them up right. When we, when we see some of this stuff, go, go get, real quick, get to, go back to Romans chapter 16. I want to make sure we get this. Because, of course, you can't talk about Romans chapter 1 without getting Romans 16, 25, and 26. In fact, I don't think you can have a grace conference without talking about Romans chapter 16, 25, and 26 at least once. He says, Now to him that is, is of power to establish you. He's already said that I, the reason I want to come is I want to give you a spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. And what he's saying here is, Now to him that is of power to establish you. The person that's going to make you stable is the one that gave you the opportunity and the information to become stable. And that stability that we have, that we have access to, you know, you think Romans chapter 5 where he talks about the fact that we have this that we have by faith we have access into this grace wherein we stand how do you access the grace that you already have it's by faith and so how is it that you're going to be established how is it that you're going to access this stability is by faith by trusting in what God's word says to you and about you when we, when we go through, he says, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So he's telling us there's three things that we need to look at here. One, his gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and the scriptures of the prophets. You know what that reminds me of? Time passed, but now, ages to come. Because when you think about that three, that trifold difference there, my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, and the scriptures of the prophets. Now, I've always taken that. You could take that two different ways. My gospel, preaching of Jesus Christ. You've got my gospel, book of Romans. That's the foundation. That's where you find out about the gospel, what Christ did for you. Then you've got, then you've got the preaching preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery starts off with the book of Ephesians. Then you take a look at that and say, well, the prophets of the scriptures, that would be 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Those are the three foundational things that you have in Paul's books. That's the three foundational doctrinal books. Well, then you could also apply it to the overall scripture. My gospel, the books of Romans through Philemon. Then you got the preaching of Jesus Christ, his earthly ministry, but we read that and study that based upon according to the revelation of the mystery. And we know that we don't apply those to our lives or try to go back and believe those, those verses or try to apply them in our, in our daily walk. And then you've got the, the scripture of the prophets, which would be the Old Testament, and then you've got the fulfillment of the prophets. So you've got a couple different ways you can look at that. Either way you go, whether you're, whether you're established in what Paul's gospels are dealing with, what his, what his Romans through Philemon, his, his epistles, and then the entire scripture. And as we take a look, that's the, that's the way that God is going to establish us is through that. And so then, then we can continue on from there. So I want to grab a couple things real quick. Go get, uh, go get Ephesians chapter 4, and then also go get Psalm 55. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4 and Psalm 55. <clears throat> We we recently on Wednesday nights we've done a we've done a series for a little while and then we stopped it and then we picked it back up. 
dealing with what we believe and why. And it's just kind of a, a treatise on here's where we stand on some things. The problem with that is when you've got 31 videos to explain where you stand and why, not too many people are going to watch them all. But So we're going to work on that. But the idea is the fact that there is a gospel you can believe, a, a, a Bible you can trust, a Bible study you can understand, a life you can live. There is a hope that sustains, and there's... I always forget the other one. Purpose you can fulfill. Thank you. She just added. She didn't correct. <laughs> so as we're going through that, I, I started looking at... So when we think of a hope that sustains, I'm, I'm going through, and I'm, I'm, I come across a couple verses. Psalm 55, verse 22 is one of them. Psalm 55, verse 22 Actually, let's start in verse, verse 21. <clears throat> the words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. Notice, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Now, when I saw that, when I think of sustaining, what does it mean to be sustained? To not be moved. And so when I thought about that, I said, that's exactly one of the things that Paul tells us a whole bunch of times. One of those, of course, is the verse I told you to get in Ephesians chapter 4. When we think about this stuff, he, he, the idea of the fact that he says, he shall sustain thee, how is that going to, be, how is that going to happen? He's, he never suffers the righteous to be moved. So we go to Ephesians chapter 4. And in verse 12, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, we see, of course, in Ephesians chapter 4, he starts off with the seven ones, dealing with the unity of the Spirit. And, of course, then he starts talking about the, the apostles and prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. When we look at verse 12, he says, What's the purpose of those things was for the perfecting of the saints? Well, that's edification. It's the perfecting of the saints. And then what happens is you have those perfected saints doing the work of the ministry, for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ. One of the things that hit me, and this is one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of, of what we've accidentally become through Internet, the way that the church, the body of Christ will be edified is through local assemblies edifying one another. And if you don't have a group to do that with, you need to find one and go there. We spent years out in the middle of nowhere by ourselves. And one of the things, and I don't know how many of you all were familiar with or knew Daryl Medford. He, he, was, he, was the, he was the main person for me. That, that helped me through a lot of things back back when I was younger. He was the he was the person that got me in Grace School of the Bible. He was the person that was the grader for my Grace School of the Bible classes. And when he passed away, that that at that time as 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 a young man, not understanding a lot of of, of doctrine yet, that kind of crippled me for a while. I that was one of the reasons why I first stopped watching some of the videos is just because I didn't have that person that I could go down to his church or he could come up to mine and have that personal relationship with. That devastated me as a young man that didn't know much. But one of the things that he told us, and this, this is why we're doing what we're doing now, is he said, if no one's doing the work where you are, Go do the work. Go be the person that does the work. And so from that time on, it was one of those things that we, that's the purpose of why we, we didn't have a place. We would sit and watch different people on, online, and I knew that's not where I needed to be. We needed to be doing stuff, so we started doing it, started doing the work of the ministry. And it's because of verses like this where he says, for the perfecting of the saints in the local assembly, for the work of the ministry, those, those perfected saints doing the work, 
for the edification of the body of Christ. And it's one of those things that we've said back home. If, if our group in Frankfurt is working on edifying one another, and Brother Ted's group up here is working on edifying one another, and people like Brian Ross and Brother Jordan, wherever you go, if their group is working on edifying one another, the whole body of Christ is being edified. And it's through that local assembly. And the first thing that we have to do is think of others over self. Because a lot of times it's, and we, we, we were there, well, we just don't have a place. Well, we don't have a place to go. Well, we don't. Well, the problem was is we were thinking of we and not others. And the thing is, is when we look out the world, we see a whole bunch of people that are lost and going to hell. We see some people who are in churches who are saved, possibly, and they're not fulfilling what God wants them to be in the dispensation of the grace of God. And what we need to do is we need to look at that and say, what do we now need to do? And that's what we started doing. We, we've got us a small group. We finally got us a place after a couple of years. We're meeting in a Holiday Inn Express conference room. And when you tell some people that, they think, you don't need a church? Well, the church building's not the issue. It's the fact that you get together and fellowship together one with another around God's word. That's what it comes down to. And as we go through this, these are some of the things that we see. We continue on. Till we all come into the unity of the faith. Now that's one of those that I've always thought about. How long is that going to take us? We should work on this till death or the rapture. So when is our job complete? Never. So then when we look at this, the purpose of us is to edify one another until that day. And death or the rapture, either one of them, that's when we stop doing the work. And then we get to go do some more work to glorify Jesus Christ forever in the heavenlies. To just stop and think about that, that puts life in perspective. That's the type of stuff that was living in and through young Charlotte. By the way, that's the same stuff that can live through each and every one of us if we choose to. That's, that's where it comes down. Notice, and the knowledge of the, of, of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by, with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You know, the opposite of not being moved, of not being sustained, is being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Well, this is nice and shiny. What's this? Well, this is nice and shiny. Well, this is something new. What is this over here? And all, there was a young lady. There was a, there was a lady back at the old church that we used to go to. Just about the time you think she's got it, she comes in and says, Brother Gray, John Hagee said, <laughs> and then she'll come back the next week and say, I just think Joel Osteen's got something. <laughs> And then she came in one day and says, well, I don't see anything wrong with the New King James Bible. And I'm thinking, hmm, it's always something new. Something, something, something. And, and when we think about what Paul and what we said with, with Timothy, Paul is saying, go back to the doctrine. Go back to the thing that, that establishes us. Go back to the thing that makes sure that we're stable. And all it is is what God's doing today during the dispensation of the grace of God through people and he's producing his life in and through us. Now, when we talk about that in uh, probably tomorrow morning, yeah, tomorrow morning, actually a little bit tonight, tomorrow morning, when we, when we take a look at those things, to, to think that the possessor of heaven and earth chooses us to, when I say chooses us, that's not a Calvinist thing, but he chooses by his own volition to use our body to produce his life in this world. That's amazing. Because what we normally think of is what we're taught as young people, especially in denominational things, is God's, we can never get there. 
we can hope, we can pray, we can strive. One day we might be able to. And what God says is, just rest in my son, let me do my work, and I'm going to manifest my life in you. And we get to be a part of that, not just now, but in the ages to come. And I guess I should say that, not just in the ages to come, but now, in this life. He's choosing to re reveal himself in this world right now through us. And all we need to do and all he's asking us to do is just rest in my son. Just sit down, read my word, study my word. When, when Paul says in Ephesians 3, where he, say, where he says, Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge of the mystery. He just asks us to read. And then by simple faith believe what that verse says. But as we keep on going, <clears throat> but speaking in the truth and love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. When we think about what's going on there, there's something effectual working. We're going to talk about that later on. There's an effectual working that's taking place in the church, the body of Christ, specifically each member of the local church. Each one of us, there's something working in and through us that what he does is says, <clears throat> according to the effectual working, uh, in the measure of every part, make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. One of the things that we think about is no matter what we are we're important you know brother brother Ted took me over to the Christian Hall of Fame and one of the pictures said what was it? unknown unknown Christian because it had had pictures I don't know how many of you all have been over has pictures of all the the men of the faith and and, and their their stories what's going on, who they were, what they, what they contributed to, to the church. And then you get to the very last one, and it's unknown Christian. And what it's about is the lay person in the, in, the, in the body of Christ, in the church, you're just as important as somebody that, that wants, that's decides to stand up here. In fact, I would almost say more important than the person that decides to stand up here. Because that's where the life is. The life is in the people that, that come and they do the work and they do this and they, and they just, because they want to be a part of what God's doing, they go and they do that work. And when Paul says, whatsoever you do, whether in word or deed, do all unto the When we do everything for the glory of God, that's what, we were talking about that and he said, that's probably my favorite one. And at first I thought, well, that's kind of an odd thing, but yeah, it is. That's probably the best one in there. Because all these other people probably did it to have their pictures up in a place like that. And everybody else, the unknown Christian, was the person that did it because they wanted to, and they weren't looking for glory. And what they were doing is actually glorifying Jesus Christ in everything that they do. And that's what we're doing with there. He says, which every joint supplieth. How is it that every joint, every part of that local assembly and the, 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 the body of Christ as a whole, how is that working? It's according to the, to the effectual working in the measure of every part. So there's something behind the people choosing to do those things, and it's part of this, this standing that we have. Notice as he continues on, <clears throat> verse 17, he says, I, I say, therefore... Because of what I just got through talking about in the previous 16 verses, and really the first three chapters, he's saying, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him 
as the truth is in Jesus. And I'm going to stop there for a second because we're going to talk about the, the rest of that chapter here in a little bit. When we, when, we come to, when we come to what's going on here, he's dealing with the fact that he's saying, based on, based on what we're supposed to be doing, based upon the ministry that each one of us has, and the fact that every joint supplying according to what's going on, that effectual working, he says, I, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth from this point forward walk not as other Gentiles walk. So what we find out is part of this having others over self, it's just part of our walk. It's part of who we are. And we're just going to sit back and allow God's word to do its work in and through us. Go over to Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 5, we notice here, verse 1, Paul says to the folks in Galatia, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. When you think about what's going on in Galatia at this particular time, there, there's people coming in trying to say you need to live under the law. And what Paul is saying, it says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty that you already have. And, he said, and the issue there is circumcision. Now, of course, there's other issues that we could talk about today, whether it's baptism, water baptism, whatever it may be. And he's saying, all you need to do, Galatians, is what? Go back and find out the liberty that you have. Well, where are we going to find that? We well, said, really, he's saying, go back to Romans. Because how do you get rid of law? We well, go back and you read Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8. You find out some things that are taking place there, specifically Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, he's telling them, that's what, he's taking them back. You have liberty that you already have in Christ. Go back to Romans chapter 7, you're going to find out that you're free from the law. And that's going to take care of their issue there. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Why? That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. And so what he's dealing with, he's saying, based upon the information that you already have, just take a stand in where you are. One of the things that I've thought about years ago is the fact that we have a position with Christ where we're seated with Christ. And he's saying, here, I want you to take a stand. And it has to do with now we're going to say let's take a walk based upon our standing. And when we think about this, one of the things that, that just jumps out at me, when he's telling us to take a stand, that's that same idea as being sustained, that we're not going to be moved. Don't be tossed to and fro. Take a stand on something. Well, what's that stand? Where is that stand going to be? This book. And so then... One of the phrases that I've heard years ago was, if you're standing the whole time and it comes time to stand, you don't have to get up. You're already, you've already taken a stand on something. Because your faith is based upon what God's Word is dealing with and what God's Word says is true about you and I today. Um, there's looking at this clock and it's going way too fast we do get an hour back tonight right yeah okay 
That's tonight? Oh, okay. So then I get it tomorrow? No. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Therefore, my brethren, again, taking us back to what he's dealing with in the previous four or previous three chapters, more specifically, if you look at chapter 3, verse 20, he says, For our conversation, which is dealing with our walk, is in heaven, from whence also we look for the, the, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast, where? In the Lord. My dearly beloved, how is it that you can stand fast in the Lord if you don't know your position in the Lord? You can't. One of the things that I've heard years ago is you can't teach what you don't know. Well, I take that one step farther and say you can't live what you don't know. And you can't stand on something if you don't know it. So he's saying you need to first understand something about who you are in Christ. Well, where do we find that at? Go back to Romans. And when we go through 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, what's the main issue that he starts off with in, th in verse 16? He's talking about all scriptures given by inspiration of God is the profitable. Where are you going to find profit in God's word? He's saying it's profitable for what? Doctrine. The very first thing he says. You can't go and do the other things if you don't know the doctrine. There's a lot of times people... People will jump up. I, I, you know, it, it's really cute when you have a three-year-old kid stand up on a, on a pulpit and, and scream into a, a microphone, but there's no edification there. What's even worse is when you've got a 40-something-year-old guy that has as much information as a three-year-old standing up doing the same thing. And that's scary. When we, when we realize that we're not just dealing with people, we're dealing with souls, and we're dealing with eternity. You're either going to live in the lake of fire, or you're going to live in eternity, or you're going to live with Christ forever. Either way, there's no end. It talks about where the worm dieth not. That's suffering forever. And there's a whole bunch of people out there that's, that's dealing with that and so then when we think about what's going on, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, he tells us what? It's God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, if we're not sure what we're supposed to do, where do we start? Go get people saved. What do you need to do in order to know how to go get people saved is you need to know the gospel to begin with. Again, you can't teach what you don't know. And so then one of the things that we've looked at in our group is there is a gospel that you can believe. To be able to come up to a person and ask them, there's a young man that I've got at school, and I, this is what I've done with him. He's come up to me, and he says, Mr. Reeser, how do I go up there and I don't go down there? We've had, we've had probably, what, three or four shootings in our, in our area the past probably three weeks in a row. One of them involved four of our former students, two of which I actually had in class. One was actually still going to school. Um, some kids came over to try to buy some, some, some pot. They paid him with a $20, $20 counterfeit bill. Well, the kid that was trying to sell the pot shot two of them. One of them died. The other one, he's ended up living. The other one, he ran away and got away. So then a lot of the kids at school are, are now coming to me saying, what happened to him when he died? And that's why this young man comes up and he says, I don't want to go. I don't want to go down there. What do I need to do to go up there? And have that opportunity in a public high school to talk about that to that young man, and to be able to give him a King James Bible with some highlighted verses and say, "Go read these and come talk to me." To be able to say, "If you were to die today, do you know where you would go? If you stood before God, why would he? What would your answer be if he said, what?" What, sh what should I, why should I allow you into my heaven? 
to have a question like that for a person. So I asked him. He said, well, I'm a pretty good guy. I've, I've not I've not done anything. I said, that doesn't mean anything. And I showed him some verses. We, we looked over Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. And he said, so you're telling me me being good is nothing? I said, absolutely nothing. The only way you can get to heaven is if you have perfect righteousness. You can't do that. We can't do that. The only way that we can have perfect righteousness is if God does something for us to give us that, and he's already done that. He's made it possible to give you and I his perfect righteousness so that we have a perfect standing in his son before him. And when he looks at us, he looks and sees his son. Now you talk about something powerful. To be able to, to, be able to present a gospel like that and not say, well, just accept Christ in your heart and pray this little prayer walk this aisle, do this thing, whatever it is. The only thing that grace accepts is faith. And what we need to do is be able to take that information and go get people, get them saved and bring them to the knowledge of the truth. You can't get them to the knowledge of the truth if they're not saved. A lot of times churches try to do that. Let's get you to work. Because that work's going to make sure that everybody knows that you're saved. Because I think you got saved. They're probably still going to hell. And that's scary. So when we take a look at what we're doing today as ambassadors, our goal is to get people saved and bring them to the knowledge of the truth. That knowledge of the truth is this edification process that we're looking at, dealing with Romans chapter 16 and then specifically 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That, the purpose, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We are completely and totally equipped to do exactly what God wants us to do. All we have to do is, by simple faith, believe what this book says about us. The faith that Paul's dealing with, that mutual faith, is that body of doctrine that was delivered to and through Paul, dealing with the faith of Jesus Christ. You know why it's so important for us to, when we see those words, faith of Jesus Christ, why we care about the word of the doctrine that we teach is based upon his faith. The faith that he showed when he went to the cross. He said, God, and we're going to look at this a little bit later on. He says, I believe what your word says. I'm going to the cross. That's that. When we look at the Christian life, it's do you believe the words on the page to you or not? That's all it is. That's, I'm not finished with this, but there are some things, I'm looking at the time, but there are some things that I do want to deal with as we look at this. The whole purpose of building, we have the foundation. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, take heed how you build thereupon. We've got to be careful how we build on that. Now you can take a really good foundation and you could build junk on it and it's going to fall down. You can take really good building materials, build something really nice on a bad foundation, it's going to fall too. So the foundation that we have, the building material that we can use, which is God's word, that's what he wants us to do. Understand it rightly divided because if we don't, we're going to be building with material that's not going to be fit and be profitable for what God's wanting us to do. So when we take a look at some of these things, as we continue on, the building's the issue. I do want to finish up with one thing. Get 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'll finish up this first part with 2 Corinthians chapter 5. When we look at what's going on here, the result of the edification process is the word of God's going to be effectually working in us. And so that's, that's the next step that we're going to look at that edification process, if we get and understand what God's doing today in the dispensation of the grace of God and, and allow that to be the issue, then all we're going to have is allowing the Word of God to work exactly how He says it's going to work. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, and he's talking about our physical body that we have, we have a building 
of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens for in this this physical earthly house this earthly house of this tabernacle he says for in this we groan every single day I'm, I've, got, I've, I've gotten to the age that getting up out of a chair I'm like Ugh, that's not good he says for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven if so be that being if so be that being clothed we shall be not found naked for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened not for that we we that we would be unclothed but clothed upon that or that mortality might be swallowed up of life now he that hath wrought for us the self same thing as God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the spirit Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Notice, wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and continues on. When we take a look at what's going on here, God's already given light unto our because you think our spirit was was dead he gave life to our spirit our soul was darkened he gave light to our our soul the only thing that's left is this body to be changed and that's that glorious hope that we can look for and say that's going to sustain us through this life because i've got a hope out there that no matter what goes on in this life i've got a promise that says if i'm absent from this, from this body i'm present with the lord the worst thing somebody could do to you today in this in this physical body is to kill us. I want to be present with the Lord if that took place. And you think of you think of somebody that's got that as a backup plan. <laughs> now that's a retirement plan that I'm I'm a big fan of. Because you're gonna tell me you're gonna you're gonna take this away and you're gonna give me something that's gonna be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Let's get on with it. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word here this evening. As we take a look at this information, our hope and prayer is that we take a look at the information and study it out for ourselves and find out whether or not this is so and allow your word to have its perfect work in and through us that we just get out of the way and just trust what your word says that we might be to the praise and honor and glory of your grace and your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray.